Okay, hello everybody. Um, in this video, I'm going to walk you through graphing several of your trig functions. When you graph your trig functions, make sure your calculator is in radian mode. Um, for this video, you don't need a calculator, but somewhere in your notes, please, please, please write down to make sure your calculator is in radian mode when you are using your calculator. Let Let's go ahead and look at our first one. The first thing you need to know about graphing your trig functions is number one, um, you need to know what is going to be your x value and what's going to be your y value. Okay, So on this, your x value is the angle itself. And notice I am in radian mode. x is always going to be theta or the angle. Your y value is going to be the trig ratio. Okay? So for sine, the trig ratio is, you know, on our um, or in last unit when we were using the x and y axis, your sine ratio was your y value divided by your r value. Okay? If you look on your trig table, you will see you can go down the sine column and you can find all your radians. Oops. Look at your radian column and look in the sine column. So the radian will be your x value and the sine column will be your y values. Okay? So when x or, or when your radians are zero, your x is excuse me, when your radians are zero, x is zero, and your y is also going to be zero. Okay, so we're right here at the origin when um I think I'm going to change the color of my points. Uh, let's do it this way. All right. There we go. Can you see that dot real quick? Barely. All right. And then um, when your angle is negative pi over 2, so you're at negative 90 degrees, your sine ratio would equal negative 1. When you're at negative pi, you're back at 0. When you're at 3 pi over 2, you're at positive 1, and then you go back down. So what, you ha what happens with the, when you graph sine of x, you get this kind of like a roller coaster. You're going to go up and down, up and down, up and down, over and over and over again. Okay. If you plot these points at pi over 2, you should be at positive 1. At pi, you'll hit the x-axis. And then at 3 pi over 2, you'll be down here at negative 1. And then back at the x-axis for 2 pi. Make sure you have those points plotted first. And then all you have to do is connect all your dots and kind of give yourself curves. They're not sharp angles. They're curves. And notice mine are kind of squiggly. Try to be as precise as you can. You want it to be fairly uh, smooth and curvy down at your turning points, okay? So let's look at cosine. For cosine x, um, again, look on your trig table. Your angles are your x values. The trig ratio for cosine, that if you just go down your cosine column, those are your y values, okay? When you graph it, uh, let me pull up the graph real quick, order, send it to the back. So when you graph it, it looks very similar to your sine function, but it's slightly different. This time, with the sine function, you started at 0, 0. This time, um, when x is 0, your y value is positive 1. And, and then at pi over 2, you're at zero and then at pi you're at one negative one okay so you still have this same basic curve you're just slightly shifted all right make sure you plot all the points and then connect all the dots with the it almost looks like uh, waves right all right so when they are both graphed this is what it looks like your sine goes through the origin cosine is up here and they are just pretty much they follow the same pattern just one is slightly shifted left or right of the other okay um i noticed i forgot to point out the domain the range and your period for now right now just write these down we'll go over them in class on what it means okay 
for your cosine, you're going to have <clears throat> the same, <coughs> excuse me, the same domain and range, but end period. They're all the same, right? Yep. The cosine and sine have the same domain range and period. Uh, let me move it back down. And then that's what they both look like. If you graph both of them in your calculator together, that's what they look like. All right, moving on to tangent. Uh, again, go down your trig table. These are the values for tangent. Notice we have these undefined terms here and here. What that looks like on your graph is asymptotes. Okay, remember our asymptotes from earlier in the year? We end up getting these asymptotes. And I know that there's more of this graph than there are values up here. It's okay. Um, the main thing to remember is that your pattern is going to keep on repeating. And you will have asymptotes all over the place. The longer you go this way and the longer you go that way, you're going to keep getting more and more asymptotes. With tangent, you intersect at the origin. A couple of your key points are at negative 1 and 1. Um, at 1, this, if this is pi over 2, then this tick mark here would be pi over 4. Okay, I'm going to try to write it. So pi over 4, okay, and this would be negative pi over 4. That's where you're hitting the positive 1 and the negative 1, all right? And then you have asymptotes here and here. Now, it's very difficult to do the domain in interval notation. You have to do it in set notation because you, have, you keep getting these asymptotes. Every time you're in increments of pi over 2, you're going to have another asymptote. Okay, and these are the distance from here to here is a whole pi apart. So it's increments of pi over 2. You'll have an asymptote. Your range is from negative infinity to positive infinity. It's going to keep on going down that way and up that way. And then in class tomorrow, we'll talk about the period. Go ahead and fill that out, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, all right, so cotangent is going to look very similar to tangent. Let me do, move this to the back so you can see it. This time, it almost looks like you have the, exactly the same graph. If you compare the two, they're not exactly the same. They just look very similar. Okay, this time, instead of having an asymptote at pi over 2, now you have an asymptote at 0 and at pi and at 2 pi and 3 pi and 4 pi and 5 pi. So at every increment of pi, you're going to have an asymptote. Okay. Um, your, your range and your period will be the same, just your cotangent is slightly shifted. And if you compare the two graphs, your curves are going different directions. Okay, So these ones are decreasing curves. With tangent, you have increasing curves. If you flip back, our tangent, if you go from left to right, tangent is increasing and cotangent is decreasing from left to right. Okay, again, you have these points here and here. These, again, are at pi over 4, and increments of pi over 4 are, are where you'll hit the negative 1 and the positive 1. So let's look at those two graphs together in the calculator. Notice cotangent's going down, tangent's going up, tangent intersects the x-axis, cotangent intersects, let's see, what is it intersect? Pi over 2. Okay. The reason why I want you to graph these by hand is because in the calculator you don't have all your x values of pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and so on. Okay. Uh, let's look at secant and then cosecant. These graphs look really, really interesting. Um, I, the first time I ever graphed cotangent, co-secant and secant, I thought I had messed up just because they look so weird. All right, so let's look at them. There you go. You have these little, I don't know what, hills and valleys, I guess. Okay, stalactites and stalagmites, maybe. So up here, you get the, the little U's, and down here, upside-down U's. <clears throat> and then you have asymptotes again. 
very unusual graphs. It's because of these undefined terms that you get these asymptotes. And your maximum and minimum points on these hills are going to be at 1 and negative 1. Okay? Get, get, write down the domain and range and period. We'll talk about that further tomorrow. Right now, focus on getting these graphs drawn on your paper as accurately as you possibly can. Make sure you have your maximum points and minimum points down and your asymptotes. Okay, And then cosecant looks very similar to secant. You've got the hills and valleys again um, and the asymptotes again. It almost looks like the exact same graph. If you compare the two, they're just slightly shifted versions of each other. Oops, I put my minimum, ma minimum maximum point there in the wrong spot. Okay, again, these are at negative 1 here and positive 1 up here. Um, if you compare the two, it looks like you just shifted the paper over slightly. They look very similar to each other. They're just these little hills, stalactites and stalagmites. Um, all right. So on to your inverse signs. I am so far we've graphed all of our regular fu sign functions. Now we're doing inverse functions. Now remember with inverses, if you know the trig ratio and you're looking for the angle, then you can do inverse sign. So in all the other graphs, your x value was your angle theta and your y value was whatever the trig ratio was, either 1 to square root of 2 over 2, square root of 3 over 2, whatever it was. Okay, With your inverse functions, you're flipping your x and your y value. So now y is the angle and x is the trig ratio. Well, because if you look at the regular sine graph, um, if you, whoops, this is actually cosine, but it's okay, it'll work. Um, remember with our inverse functions, it, you have to draw the horizontal line test, and if you intersect in more than one spot, you cannot have a graph, it won't work. So with this sine and cosine and tangent inverse functions, you have to set a limit so that you will not have, um, so that you'll be able to have a function. I know we did limits on our inverse functions a long time ago. This is a, we're looking at it again. Hopefully you'll remember this. Um, but because we have to set limits, your si inverse sine function is actually very short. It starts here and it stops here. That's all it goes. It's a very limited graph. Um, there's not a lot that you can do with it. Okay, and the cosine function, <clears throat> excuse me, the inverse cosine function is going to be very limited too, but it's a slightly shifted version of it. Let me bring it up. Oops, sorry, I need to bring that to the back. Back, there we go. So that's what the inverse cosine function looks like. I will tell you the easiest way to draw these plot the starting point, the stopping point, and the point where it intersects the x or y-axis, and that'll, and then you just do kind of a curvy line there. Okay, same thing with sine, starting point, stopping point, and the point where it intersects the axis, and do a curvy line. Okay, all right, so that's inverse sine and inverse cosine. Inverse tangent is a little bit different. Again, you're going to have two asymptotes because of the way the, the tangent function looks like. And this is what your inverse function is going to look like. You have an asymptote at pi over 2 and an asymptote at negative pi over 2. Your intersecting points are at 0, um, at 1, or excuse me, at negative 1 and pi, negative pi over 4, and positive 1 and pi over 4. And then, and that's really the only three key points that you have. Make sure you fill out the domain and the range values for all of these graphs. That's all the graphs. Um, 
right now, just make sure you get these graphs drawn as accurately as you can um, and get the domain and range written down. If you need to rewind and go back, go ahead and do so. We're going to explore the graphs and kind of dissect them and find out where all the asymptotes are and all that fun stuff in class tomorrow. And it'll probably take us a couple days to go through all of the trig functions. So we have six trig graphs to look at and then there and then three of the inverse functions. All right, so hopefully you've gotten this down. If you need any extra help um, or if you need to look at it again, pause it and rewind it. Go back to where you need help and make sure you get everything done correctly. All right, see you tomorrow.